From the author that has appeared in Harvard, Business Week, TechCrunch, VentureBeat, and Giga Om, it's Larry Chiang. Polishing turds. If this entire class can be summed up on one slide, it'd be Andrew Mason's slide, which is polishing up our turds, getting super rich. Now, we are in CS 23 e for edit Lecture 15, and this sits very well timed. This lecture sits super well timed between customer development cycle and crossing the chasm. We are in Lecture 15. And with lecture 15, it literally sits between lecture 14, which is working on the customer development cycle and crossing the chasm. And in this lecture, we're going to talk about polishing a turd, selling something that we are editing is in essence polishing a turd because the turd was left over and the founders went to, to GSB or HBS. And we are left to pick up the pieces and having to sell something that exists. And we're gonna do so with a handful of dirty tricks. By dirty, I mean things that seem of low dignity. Dirty not like it's illegal or wrong or immoral. Dirty in that some of this work is not glamorous to do. Uh, running a table is not glamorous to do. So that's why it's called uh, polishing a turd. Uh, aligning yourself with a Woodstock or a Snoopy or a Bixby the Bear, Bixby the Sheep. Not super dignity inspiring things, but that's why we're called upon to polish this turd. That's what we're called upon in doing this edit, to practice on this cadaver. In the example that Andrew Mason, the founder of Groupon, talked about in Polishing Up Your Turd was Groupon, where it is an edit of his own thing, The Point. Uh, the Point, P-O-I-N-T-E where the point was a political activist fundraising type of platform that never really got traction. Instead, polishing up that turd of doing one merchant deal in Chicago for merchant deals, loaded up on a WordPress page, one deal per day. WordPress isn't a particularly uh, technologically advanced tool, but it served the purpose of, of polishing up the turd that was the point, the piece of crap that was Grouspawn, Grouspawn, and polishing that up to turn it into Groupon, which is really just a manifestation of an old Chicago business called Entertainment Coupon Book. So doing half off deals, doing 50% off, is really what the point ended up doing in calling it Groupon which then took off because it was um, deals, daily deals uh, in your email. This is something that was stressed at basis events, basis business associations, Stanford Engineer Society basis, where Andrew Mason talked about how he would trade one email address for 10 Twitter followers. Let me repeat that, he would trade one email address for 10 Twitter followers, meaning that's what turd polishing is about, is about collecting names and then parlaying that name, email address, cell phone number collection into a potential revenue event later on. So Andrew Mason was very cognizant to, to be willing to trade off one email address for 10 Twitter followers. And the collection of email addresses is critical when you're doing hand-to-hand -hand combat in the trenches that is not particularly glamorous, uh, but doing lead generation. That's what Lecture 15's core is about. Because remember, you're sitting in between customer development cycle and trying to cross the innovation chasm. 
a personal experience that I had in selling for a Fortune 500 company in Chicago was incredibly counterintuitive to me. I worked at Nalco Chemical Corporation as a technical, as a chemical sales engineer in technical sales. Delivering donuts and getting people on the third shift, the second shift, the first shift inside of plants underneath the plant manager, getting people their donuts was absolutely critical. And it's totally counterintuitive because you think you would sell on engineering specs, competence of sales representative, uh, quality of chemical. None of those things really mattered as much as are you able to deliver the donuts on time? Are you able to secure donuts and purchase enough of them to distribute to the people who were handling the administration and the the uh, dispensing of chemical, water treatment chemical into the water? It's, it was completely counter to anything that I st understood in college. And so donuts really mattered. and. They're a form of a sales premium. Uh, a premium is something that you give for free when you uh, sell them something. So a sales premium. I'm gonna refer back to the last lecture for customer development cycle. Pizza, xiaolongbao, which is a Chinese dumpling, and shih tzus. These are all things that are sales premiums. These are all somewhat gimmicks. Uh, using Woodstock uh, as a stuffed animal is somewhat of a gimmick. And you, the use of pizza slices in exchange for email address cannot be uh, stressed enough. You wanna use food as a trade-off for attention. You wanna use food as a trade-off in collecting a personally uh, identifiable piece of information, which is an email address, which is a cell phone number. Slices of pizza, xiaolongbao, and shih tzus in Woodstock. The use of premiums, sales premiums, cannot be stressed enough. A sales premium is where I give you something, uh, a rubber duck, uh, a comic book of that cat, a Tony Robbins book, which was given to me by Dreamforce 2015, uh, which is, by the way, a great book. A great, great book. Um, Money, Master the Game. It's chapter two, uh, Treasure Management. It's awesome. That Tony Robbins book is amazing. Or ducks, ducks that are. Uh, where you sign up for a, uh, a contest and I give you a duck. Or with Waze, where you're getting a car charger adapter where you plug this in your car, this holds your, your cell phone, so this holds your cell phone, and that is a sales premium. That's a sales premium where you are selling and doing customer development cycle using a sales premium. That's part of polishing up your turd. So the use of sales premiums and finding things that are cute and are awesome that give you an advantage because you're collecting an email address, you're collecting a cell phone number, you're collecting a lead. Agents, uh, Hollywood agents, will give their talent start gifts where if you're at the start of representation, you get a start gift. It's a form of a sales premium. And here, there's a picture of a Theta pillow, where this Theta pillow is essentially a start gift for when we start up with a Cap Alpha Theta. It's a sorority, and if you're starting up a relationship, what could reduce sales friction than a little bit of theta love. And that's what a start gift is meant to do, is to reduce friction. Uh, it's to reduce uh, startup uh, abnormalities or startup 
uh, deactivation energy if you're a chemical engineer. So you're lowering the activation energy. And that's what a start gift is meant to be, is a form of a sales premium for when you're working with or starting up uh, a relationship, which is what a dating relationship is super similar to a salesy relationship as well. So that's a start gift. It's a form of sales premium. It's just like a donut. It's just like Shalom Bao. It's like a Shih Tzu. A second stage premium is exactly what it sounds like. It's a second stage sales premium. This is actually a second stage premium, the Waze car charger. You have to get a certain level of uh, Waze gamification points, uh, activating your account, and a second stage premium is a, a, a secondary premium. I'm trying to use words that aren't part of second stage premium, but it is what it is. And the use of a second stage premium is after you collect an email address, how do you further reward your new user and retain the monthly active user MAUs where, what have they done? And if they've retained themselves, then you give them a gift. So it's like a second stage gift. In romance, it's very similar to getting another gift after your start gift. And this is an entire chart of, of second stage premiums, and this is the chart that Duck9 uses as far as uh, sales, selling, retention, and doing lead generation. This is a professional baseball and at baseball games they'll just lob them out as if they're just handing out swag and this baseball is a great example of premium swag you could just buy the baseball for $24.95 or you can just get handed one for free by a professional baseball player who just hands one out and maybe he'll sign it maybe he won't but this is a great example of a sales premium Stickers. This is these are stickers for uh, my buddy's computer, Nick Lee. He's a CS major. He is uh, covered in swag, and the reason for it is these are all premiums that he has gotten because he is out there selling and out there pitching. He is absolutely locked in. That's why he's got his cap pulled over his eyes. He is locked in selling over the phone and all these stickers are forms of swag where he is promoting uh, these different startups and he is a CS major who can sell and promote as well as any econ major. He's a CS major. You can follow him, Nick Austin Lee. Nick Austin Lee. He's uh, currently a bigwig at Adobe. So this is your springboard moment. This is the diagram where you have a bunch of little success, little success, little success, and this is your springboard moment. Remember, you're editing a cadaver. You're rescuing something that does not have a heartbeat, which is you're associating a sales premium. You're drafting behind a, another chasm to help this startup that's a cadaver cross the chasm. You're, you're, you're DJing uh, energy that's around us. And that's why some of these little, little, little accomplishments uh, will lead to your springboard moment. And you've got to see the fact that now that you're doing sales and promotional work for this cadaver, that this is your springboard moment. This is incredibly important and it's worth stressing because we're practicing on a cadaver. So we want to do edit cs 183 e for edit so there's a tiny moment a tiny edit a tiny moment of selling and promotion a tiny edit a tiny moment of sales promotion is a small and tiny edit and these things cascade and lead to your pro moment where you develop the pre-existing team, even if it's just one buddy of yours, now you're a pro because you've had a sequence of tiny edits. 
you now are a pre-existing team that has practiced on this cadaver and now you are pro. And that's what these tiny edit, tiny edit, tiny edit, now you're a pro and you're reducing your fear of getting out there and promoting. You're reducing your fear and raising your hope by having these tiny sequence of edits, small edits, micro edits, small edits, now all of a sudden you're pro because you've had a sequence of positive things. I'm literally now going to be ostentatious enough to compare myself to Michael Jordan and your Kobe Bryant. Now this is the 1991 uh, Jordan 6 shoe and the Jordan 6 shoe is actually worn by Kobe Bryant and if you look at what Kobe did. He drafted behind Michael Jordan by recognizing him as a mentor and then replicating a lot of his different moves and scoring and the ability to put the ball into the basket using muscle memory. That's what CS183E Lecture 15 is all about. It is about some of these tiny uh, behavior shifts these tiny edits, these micro small behavior changes in doing sales and selling promotion leading you to a springboard moment, leading you to become a legendary basketball player in and of yourself, a Kobe Bryant who is drafting behind Michael Jordan. So you're going to be drafting behind Woodstock or me or Previous, my mentor, Mark McCormack, doing small sales promotional things helps you edit. Just all the things that Marty Pitchinson also talks about. Bikers absolutely ride behind each other to draft each other. Now, this slide is very uh, familiar to you because it's from CS183S, S for sales. Now, there's no need, no trust, and no momentum. So... There's no need, prospect, sales prospect doesn't really have a need, uh, there's no trust, and that's why you're trying to use sales premiums to try to prime the pump of a conversation. And then there's no momentum, and that's why you're trying to draft uh, a chasm. You're, that's why you're trying to, to DJ the chasm, which is actually going to be expanded upon greatly, timed super nicely, into the next lecture. Uh, Lecture 17, where drafting and connecting up two chasms, drafting by reducing friction, uh, drafting by moving behind your mentor as you are the mentee. And the previous slides of Tiny Edit, Tiny Edit, Tiny Edit, those are from BJ Fogg. Uh, those are his slides for small things. And that's what, that's what in essence, it was so hard for the original startup founders to do. They were not able to do some of these things, and therefore, they were not able to cross the innovation chasm. And that's what uh, this bicycle diagram is meant for, is to remind you that bicyclists travel in packs. And when you're riding directly behind somebody, that wind is no longer in your face and you're drafting behind them. So aerodynamics also leads to a great slide for the founders of aerospace engineering because they actually used bikes to fund their airplane invention. I know, mind blown, right? These slides are storyboarded out so perfectly, it's actually scary. So in the last slide, I talked about drafting behind to reduce sales friction, uh, mentorship, uh, being a mentee, how Kobe Bryant was the mentee to Michael Jordan, the mentor, how their moves were pattern replicated. There's a video, if you Google pattern replication, pattern rec iteration, pattern recognition. So it starts with pattern recognition, pattern replication, pattern iteration. So Kobe Bryant pattern iterated a lot of Michael Jordan's moves. Michael Jordan himself even said, oh, I can't beat Kobe Bryant. He stole all my moves. Uh, page 42 of Austin Kleon's book, Good Artists Create, Great Artists Steal. Uh, 
features Kobe Bryant. The Wright brothers actually, when you're talking about reducing friction, they actually used bicycles to fund airplane flight. So if you look at right now, there are two chasms. The dotted line chasm is typically what the engineering 145 startup was, or the CS183 uh, YC startup was, or the CS183B startup. So the dotted line area is where, oh, I'm trying to figure out how to cross this chasm. I'm in the dotted line area. Uh, it's pretty, it's innovative, and the founders are going to die. That's why we're doing CS183 Cadaver. That's why we're doing CS183 Edit. Because we, as the editors, we realize that there's a chasm that was already crossed. And that's what this Wright Brothers diagram is. is the dotted line area is airplane, and the solid line, which is real, is bicycles. So bicycles gained adoption back in 30,000 BC, right, when a caveman put two uh, wheels together uh, and then pushed forward. So airplanes, if you're trying to just cross the chasm and just be an airplane founder, that's going to be really tough because uh, even after, remember, even when the Wright brothers had a working prototype that would stay in the air an hour or two, the United States, anything, Smithsonian, the United States War Department, the United States Navy, they didn't buy an airplane. The first sale went to the French War Department uh, for an airplane. Now, they were the early uh, adopters. They were the, but whether or not you're going to cross the chasm, future uncertain. That's why selling bicycles back at 1307 West 3rd Street, selling bicycles is the thing that mattered because if airplanes never got sold or would have a gap where the French War Department would buy the airplane, who knows when your next sale's coming next. The Wright brothers didn't care because they kept on selling bikes. Their sister Catherine kept on selling bikes. And that's why this two chasm method is important. That's why polishing your turds is important. And when you're talking about Wright brothers and polishing turds, the way they started to sell bicycles is that they would repair their old toys to be better than new. They would edit bikes and they therefore improved the bike. They had good bicycle sales and so they're able to literally DJ in the two chasm. So this is previewing for lecture 17 but it very much applies because polishing up a turd there's no more clear turd than a toy that's broken. And that's where the Wright brothers got to practice their craft for making bicycles by fixing toys, fixing turd, polishing that turd, and then eventually inventing airplanes. Pop quiz. What chasm did Travis and Garrett draft behind when they started Uber? Which chasm did they draft behind? So this is the Uber... Uh, crossing the innovation chasm. What chasm did Travis and Garrett and Ryan Graves draft behind? So there are two chasms and I've drawn the first chasm. So your job is to reverse engineer and tell me via Twitter or text or email or Twitter what chasm they drafted behind. So it's a little bit of a pop quiz. So this is a sales table. So at a sales table, you've got your anchor, plus you've got your satellite. Anchor is the person who closes uh, for a lead, closes for a commitment, closes for a piece of personal information that then leads to a deal. A satellite is are the people that run point. Does the satellites funnel to an anchor? So the anchor's job is to close, the satellite's job is to funnel in. And here we've got a dog, and the dog's job is the anchor, and they're, you're thinking about doing a second stage premium, where let's say the front end premium is uh, 
a picture with the dog or some kind of uh, kitschy, gimmicky thing that is a front-end premium, then you've got later on second stage premiums. This is an Uber sales table sans premium. No premiums being used. Oh wait, they are using a premium. It's 750 bucks. Believe it or not, right now, if you drive 100 rides, you get $750 if you sign up for Uber. That's a premium. Isn't that amazing? So the premium actually doubles as a second stage premium because this is done at a gas station where they're not handing out cute little, uh, cute little Hubert dolls. For if you've got a bank account, you are simply just getting $300 or in this special circumstance, $750. I actually write about this in a Quora post called how much do you make as an Uber driver? And the answer is you would make a whole lot more if you did lead generation. So you're editing this cadaver, you're selling what you didn't code, that's what it takes is coming up with uh, a quid pro quo, a money in, money out, a how to make money while you are making money. In fact, that's a hashtag. H-T-M-W, while you make money. So all the initials for how to make money while you make money. How to make money while you make money. So you're spending a buck or two on the premium, you're making five to 10 bucks on a lead, and then if they're paying you to do an activation, then you tie in the second stage premium with your profitability. You tie in your second stage premium with the lifetime value, the monthly active user cost. Second stage premium. I have no idea what's going on at this table. I have no idea what's going on in this table. The salesperson behind the table is actually just reading a book sitting. Um, I, that's not Elon Musk. Elon is great at selling and promotion. Uh, Tesla's got a $3,000 premium. If you buy a Tesla and you refer a friend, they pay $3,000. Uh, he's notorious for doing spiffs, rips, and commission. Spiff is a commission. Rip is a form of commission. Commission is a form of sales commission, percentage of sale. So the entire class is based on Engineering 145, the class being online lecture 20 lecture series, CS183E, is based on Engineering 145. And Engineering 145 has as a hidden undertow, a hidden dynamic, sales and promotion and being street smart. And Othman Laraki actually mentioned Andrew Mason 2010. Othman Laraki went to, has degrees from MIT and Stanford, uh, sold the company to Twitter. Uh, Andrew Mason started Groupon. So Othman Laraki mentioned Andrew Mason and the hidden things that keep startups from dying are sales and selling. That's why we are practicing editing uh, and doing sales uh, inside of CS183E. So I just wanted to hone in on the fact that Stanford Engineering hasn't quite put its finger on it. Uh, CS183 Peter Thiel's class, lecture number nine, distribution. Peter hasn't put his finger quite on it. CS183B, Sam Altman. Sam Altman hasn't quite put his finger on sales and selling promotion. And ditto Paul Graham with his mentioning of Jessica, how startups, YC startups should focus more on sales, not as much on marketing. So these things are just under the surface and hopefully these have orchestrated into a meaningful way that Stanford Engineering uh, means to talk and mentor its own engineers in doing sales and editing without expressly advocating doing something as unpopular as editing a cadaver, as unpopular as learning sales and selling skills as an engineer. So you take the energy that is around you 
And a great example is yoga journal events, yoga journal events, where why not use the yoga journal conference, which is January 17 uh, to 20 in San Francisco of 2017 and use it as a pre-roll for South by Southwest where you're preparing to in March. So you're preparing in January to do something in March and you're using it as a pre-roll and it's an existing uh, infrastructure of events where you're just doing an offshoot event. So this is the way to find and something that's already gained adoption to massively popular yoga in the Bay Area. And you're connecting it to try to cross your own innovation chasm. So the energies around us, we just want to find something that has previously crossed the innovation chasm. And if you haven't done your Uber homework yet, it's black town cars. That's what Uber was relying upon and referring upon, which is also lecture uh, 13, which is what Uber technologies is this the Uber uh, cab of? So, black town cars is uh, the precursor to Uber, and Uber relied on black town cars in the same way that you, as tech founders, rely on Yoga Journal uh, to do something as innovative as promoting at South by Southwest. Buyer of leads for slices of pizza. Buyer of leads for slices of pizza. That's, in a nutshell, uh, something that would save a cadaver and edit where you're taking a slice of pizza which costs very little and you're rolling the dice to try to make money you're rolling the dice to try to spur and catalyze the adoption of a technology. You're using a slice of pizza to get people curious about uh, black town cars, Uber cab, or driving an Uber when you're currently driving a taxi, or doing SAT prep. So you're trying to prime the pump of commerce by initially giving something away small and free and parlaying that into uh, a real deal, a real lead. Video 23 is actually an entire YouTube of Andrew Mason talking about polishing up his turd. So here it is in its full and unfettered, unedited uh, format, which is the Polishing Turds Lecture from 2010 Startup School, which I personally used to help edit PlanCast, which was having a hard time doing social calendarization. I dj in the chasm of movies. So this is Andrew Mason talking about the point, about Groupon, and how it became Groupon by him editing a turd. You're very welcome for me finding you this video. Hi everybody, I'm Andrew. Uh, I asked uh, Paul and uh, Jessica what they thought I should talk about and um, they thought the most useful thing, which I can totally understand, is kind of talking about all the ways I screwed up and the failures, um, since a lot of you are probably struggling with the same sort of thing right now. So um, Groupon actually started out for a year, a year and a half, we were another service called thepoint.com, which was a much more abstract and broad version of what we are today. Um, so I thought what would be fun, and this is one of those ideas that sounds really good, like when you come up with it, but then in execution, it, it usually sucks, we'll see, um, would be to give you the pitch that I used to give for the point when we were the point. Um, so I pulled together an old presentation that's pretty similar to what I would have used for that. Um, and then uh, I'll tell you all the reasons that that pitch sucks and that company sucks and uh, how we took those lessons and applied them to making the point or Groupon kind of cool. Um, so that's why it's called Polishing Your Turds and Getting Super Rich. All right, so the point. Uh, the, the Point is a company, a website that is designed to solve the problems of collective action, getting a group of people to do something that one person can't achieve alone. 
And I th thought I'd start by articulating the problems with collective action by using myself as an example. I'm not an activist. I mean, I, I read about issues. I care about issues. I wish I could make a difference. But I think the reason I'm not an activist is that I'm not sure what I can do that would actually make a difference. The options that are out there, for me, aren't very interesting. For example, why would I go stand in a, go, go to a protest when I could go be a freelance developer or something and make enough money in a day to take five college kids and send them to the protest instead? <laughs> so the problem isn't that I don't care. I just don't know what I could actually do that would lead to results. Um, and if you look at like petitions, so many of them, you look at them and it's like, what exactly is this going to achieve? So here's a, a causes thing. By the way, this presentation is circa like mid-2008, so some of the, the content's going to be a little dated, like Sarah Palin and stuff. Um, so, uh, although unfortunately that's not dated, I guess. <laughs> um, so, so stop global warming. Everybody join a petition to stop global warming. That feels really good, but what's it actually going to do? Uh, protests. This is a protest called the March for Women's Lives, I think. It was in 2004, and it might have been the largest protest or organized gathering in history with over a million people, but it was also one of the least covered. There was just no interest. For whatever reason, it was raining or something, and then just the press didn't cover it. Um, so when your tactics for creating change are at the mercy of PR, it's just like you're throwing shit on the wall and hoping that people pay attention, um, then it's not a very rational, it's not, it's not necessarily going to lead to results. So the internet came along, right? And the internet should solve all the problems of organizing people and, and changing collective action. But the problem is, all we've done is we've taken the old world tactics that we used offline and ported them online. We haven't really, we haven't really changed the way we think about things. So for example, here's a protest against the Iraq war that people held in Second Life. Um, I, call, I call these tactics the tactics of inconveniencing yourself because they're all these things, signing a petition or going to a protest, they're all like mini versions of lighting yourself on fire. They're saying, I will sacrifice a small part of my life to show you how much I care. And that just feels so futile and, I mean, not very exciting to get to be part of. Um, and the weird thing is if the tactic you're using is inconveniencing yourself, all the internet does is make it easier to sign petitions. So by making it easier to inconvenience yourself, you're making your effort more and more meaningless, right? So if it only takes one click to write a letter to your congressman, then it takes an order of magnitude more letters for them to actually care. Now, there's so much more that the web could potentially do, but we have to step back before we can get there. We're in a state of path dependency where we just look at what we did before and we continue to evolve off of that. So we, we've all kind of evolved from, from apes, right? And that's, where the, that's why we have online petitions now. But the internet, introduces, <laughs> the, introduce, the internet introduces new realities. And we have to ask ourselves, if we had those realities from day one, like maybe we would have evolved in a different direction. If we had the technology, maybe we'd all be like that. <laughs> So what are the intrinsic kind of advantages that the web provides? Here's a few. Interest-driven communities. So you're not just organized around um, by people in your immediate geography. You can organize with other people who care about the same kind of things. Group collaboration, crowdsourcing, wikis, all that stuff. C coming together and finding a, a collective solution to a problem. Uh, and instant coordination, the ability to, I mean, Twitter, right? The ability to come together and make a decision as a group uh, on a hat. None of that existed when people decided to invent petitions in the first place. So that's where the point comes in. The idea of the point is that anyone can start a campaign to organize a group of people around, uh, around a shared result that they want to achieve. And they all agree to take action or give money towards something, but only once they re reach a tipping point such that their contribution actually makes a difference. So uh, the anatomy of a campaign is you have an objective. So for example, your objective might be um, uh, say, you know, the oil company is dumping wake, uh, uh, waste in the lake, and you want them to instead develop proper waste disposal facilities. Um, so your objective is develop those facilities. People make a pledge. The pledge might be, we're going to stop patronizing this, uh, this, this gas company. We're stop buying gas from them. And the tipping point would be the point at which um, the total cost of your collective action is greater 
than the, um, the cost of change. So for example, in that example would be how many, how, what's the value of a customer to the oil company? And how many of those people do you need to offset the value of, of, uh, of, of uh, building waste disposal uh, facilities? And so that would be your tipping point. When you get that number of people, you take action. So that was the idea of the point. And, and here's a few examples of, why, of how it can be used. Um, so to use the Sarah Palin example again, here's something where people are trying to raise money to put an ad in the newspaper um, where you get a group of people together to, to create their ad. Um, so let's see. Uh, there are rational incentives for change, like we were talking about before. Um, so here's people who are saying, we're going to stop eating at KFC once we can get a million people enough, uh, unless they are willing to adopt the suggestions of their animal welfare board. So it's enough people that the customers, they would lose to offset the cost of implementing those suggestions. So it makes rational sense. And as a, as a participant, you can see why you might want to join. Here's another one where a group of people have organized um, a discount at a local business, where uh, if they can get 30 people to come in, and uh, then it's worth the business's, uh, it's worth it for the business to offer it at a lower price. Safety in numbers. So here's a bunch of people that are trying to make election day a national holiday. If they can get 100,000 people together, they're all just not going to come to work. So if you were trying to make uh, Election Day a national holiday by yourself and you didn't come to work, you'd get fired. But if enough people do it, then you have a kind of safety in numbers. Finally, it enables long shots, things, things that just never would occur otherwise. So this is a campaign uh, to create a dome over the city of Chicago. Uh, <laughs> And uh, we need $10 billion to do it. And people can, can, contrib people can put their credit card in, contribute money, but you're not charged until you hit that tipping point. So the cool thing about it is um, it allows you to separate, like, will this happen from what would it be worth to me? If you just say to someone, what would it be worth to me to make winners obsolete in Chicago? $10,000, no problem. And you know you're not on the line unless you get enough to actually make it happen. OK, so I'll cut the, the point presentation off there. Um, and I'll also say that was a terrible presentation. Like, uh, you should never give a presentation like that where you, only, you don't even show the product or you show it like 10 minutes into the presentation. So that's one kind of uh, aside. So we, we, did, we launched the point in fall of 2007, and we screwed around with it for a year, didn't really get any traction, and started thinking about making kind of fundamental changes. And we thought about what, what are the really interesting applications of this. And one of them was this collective buying idea. And we built the point so you could take these little flash widgets and embed them wherever you want on the web, like a YouTube video. So what we did was we created this thing called Groupon. And every day, it's, this is a WordPress blog. <laughs> and we would do a new post every day and embed a different uh, campaign widget from the point. And that was, that was us from fall of 2008 through like early summer of 2009 was this little bullshit thing that I whipped together in a, in a month. Um, but it worked. OK, so now I'm going to go through some of the, the lessons that we've learned that allowed us to be, I think, successful with Groupon, where we failed with, with the point. Um, this first one, you're not building a piece of art. It's a, it's a tool. and. For me, like when I originally had the idea for the point, it started off as I was frustrated because I had to pay an early termination fee from the cell phone company. And I, everybody had that problem. I wish there was a way that we could all come together and just say, we're not going to pay this fee. You can't, you, know, you, you can't charge us all if we all refuse to pay. Um, and then the more I thought about it, I realized that you could abstract that model and apply it to everything from organizing a small group of people to buy a ping pong table for their dorm, to boycotting multinational corporations, to group purchases for your local business, to funding a local park. And it became this vision of an idea, like a book. It, it became much more about uh, being truthful and, and com a, a complete representation of what the idea was than it was actually building something that was going to be useful. Um, in fact, this <laughs> down here, just to show you how extreme it was, we did a video. Uh, I did a video to, um, of myself in the year 2015 talking about like, a world where the point was fully mature that I then sent back in time uh, to, to share with, with people. 
um, as a way to like, it was, so, it was so much more about the vision than it was about just figuring out how to make something useful. Now, with Groupon, it was, it was the total opposite. It was get away from the abstract and recognize that whatever you're building, you have about one second for people to look at it and decide if it adds utility. Um, and that's what Groupon was. I mean, even the whole collective buying thing is really minimized in our presentation. It's progressively disclosed. You might realize that it's, it, when you show up, you just see half off a restaurant. That's, that's awesome. And then once you buy, it's like, oh, we still need another 30 people to join. That's cool. Um, recognize and um, embrace your constraints. So we totally didn't do this with the points. I mean, with examples like trying to build a dome over the city of Chicago, I mean, what was our plan to make that happen? It would just go viral. And honestly, when I created that campaign, I thought it would happen. <laughs> I really, <laughs> I honestly thought, I mean, I, I didn't think, it, I thought there was a, a chance it could happen. Um, so I learned this thing to embrace your constraints from uh, Scott Heiferman at Meetup. This is, I, I just put this together for, for this slide, but this is a rough version of how he described to me what the first version of Meetup was. It was just a matrix of cities and of interests, and then you decide which one you're interested in. So if, I wanna, if I'm interested in food in San Francisco, I'd click sign up. And it would say, OK, the meetup in your city is at this Starbucks at this corner. And we meet on the first Tuesday of every month. And if four people sign up, there's a meetup. If not, then not. So I think what Scott recognized is that it was going to be really hard, especially at the beginning, to get organizers, to get the human that's going to set all this stuff up and make those decisions about exactly what day should it be on, what should the location be. So he built, he, he really simplified it, took away all the complexities and just built this simple matrix that would allow it to, uh, to start getting some traction. And we did the same kind of thing with Groupon. I mean, it's the whole business model, all the decisions we made were largely around living within the constraints that we had. We had this collective purchasing platform, um, but we didn't have customers and we didn't have supply. We didn't have inventory of stuff to sell. So we decided let's start in Chicago because we can go to local businesses and get them to sign up. Um, and let's, uh, let's only do one deal a day because that's all the deals we could really get. Um, and, uh, and it was as simple as that. It was around trying, and, and it was the only way that our community is so small that we would have to channel the entire force of that community into one thing in order to get enough critical mass for the business to be willing to offer a discount. So now, um, as we're in a different reality, where um, we have different assets than we had when we started the business, we have, and completely different problems. We have, in a lot of ways, the opposite problems. So we have more merchants that we can serve. Our biggest problem as a business is the fact that we have a six-month backlist of businesses that want to be featured, which has led to the proliferation of these clones just to slop up all the people that, that, we, uh, that we can't serve. Um, we have tons of customers, and we have, an, we have operations. We have a 2,500-person staff, 1,600 salespeople around the world, um, customer service and editorial. We have this kind of deal-creating machine. So if we started the business with all these assets, we might make different decisions. And what we're working on now, the kind of product we're trying to build, is one that reimagines the, reimagines the business as if we had, this is how it always was. So you can see we have this group on 1.0 and this group on 2.0, which is stuff that we'll be releasing over the coming months. Um, which, but you can't get to group on 2.0 until you get along a certain curve in group on 1.0. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? Kind of. So have, have a growth plan. So from the beginning, we built into the, the model for group on how we were going to reach scale through email marketing, largely. We knew that we were going to have crappy deals up <laughs> from time to time. Uh, and it was going to be hard to get people to come back again and again to the site. So instead, let's get them signed up on an email list. Let's not, let's not push them to the deal. Let's push them to the sign up form for the email list. Because once they're engaged on email, then you, know, you can send them crappy deals three or four times before they want to unsubscribe. You get more chances before, before they tell you to, um, to screw yourself. Uh, and we obviously didn't have that with the point. I mean, how was this ever going to happen? 
seriously, how in the world did I think this was going to happen? Uh, the best tools aren't always cool, um, the, the, the shiny object. So email, right? I would take one email address over 10 Twitter followers any day, or 10 Facebook fans. Um, email just works really well for our, for our business. Um, what else? Salespeople. I think maybe this is being from Chicago, but we view the idea of self-service with the same skepticism that uh, someone from Google probably views the idea of hiring a salesperson. So, and, and that's part of what's made our business successful. In order to achieve real ubiquity with local merchants, you need to have a sales force, and we've invested in that. Um, for PR, for, for getting the word out on your business, we actually, how many of you heard about Groupon first from like your girlfriend or your mom or something? So that's probably more than Foursquare, right? And, it's, and we designed it that way. We specifically decided not to go after like the TechCrunch or to, to get posted on TechCrunch because we knew the moment it would happen, all of you vultures would, <laughs> would come along and abandon your fledgling social network for dogs to chase after whatever it, uh, uh, our thing. <laughs> so. <laughs> Finally, um, this is a really important one. When I was working on The Point, I had this stupid attitude, like, if you build it, they will come. Nothing can go wrong. I can go at, and here's another question. This is the last time I'll do this. How many of you, raise your hand if you are the smartest person you've ever met? <laughs> All right, let's, let me, how about if in the last year you still thought you were the smartest person you ever met? No? OK. Well, OK, so I, my, my theory is that a lot of kids who are starting startups are people who have had blessed lives, who have achieved everything they've ever done. And just failure doesn't seem realistic to them. Like, it's, it, they, they've never confronted um, real, real failure and looked it in the eyes and, and accepted it as something that could happen. And I, I don't think you have to fail. I think you just have to realize that it could happen, because it shapes the way you make decisions. Um, with the point, everything was, all the decisions I were making were around, I'm, of course this is going to work, I can't go wrong. And with Groupon, even to this day, I'm thinking about all the ways I could screw up and how to avoid that. I think the best thing, the, my best trait as a CEO is the fact that I think I suck as a CEO. Because it means I surround myself with people who make up for all those things and, and we, have a, we have a great team and so on. So this is uh, a picture from the lobby of Groupon when you walk in. We were on the cover of Forbes a couple weeks ago, and you can see that in the middle. And then surrounded by it are um, our other magazine covers with MySpace and Napster and AOL and uh, Friendster, <laughs> all those other failed businesses. So every time something great happens, I kind of look at it as my responsibility in the company to scare the shit out of people and remind them that um, that there are a lot of people who have been in our place before who, uh, where, where the story doesn't end up uh, as rosy. Um, and finally, you should quit now, because everything you go through is going to be telling you that over and over again. I mean, there were moments in our history when we were working on the point that every sign pointed to quitting. It was totally irrational for us to keep going. We had, we had so little, it's just, just that we were stubborn and didn't, we just refused to quit. Um, and, and that's what the process is going to be like. And it's unbelievably hard, and you work nonstop. And anything that, like, for me as a human being, I feel like I've been raped of any personality. I mean, I used to be able to have a social conversation with, with people normally, but I've forgotten what that's like, because all I think about in my brain is Groupon. And when this is over, I don't know if I'm going to be able to go back to being a normal person. Like this weird thing happened a couple days ago. I discovered Gmail shortcuts, uh, keyboard shortcuts, and I, I, for the next few days, I just was like happy, and I did, and and, uh, and it was like, why? What is this feeling? It's so rare. Like I've forgotten what it's like to be happy, and and it's, it's something like Gmail shortcuts make it happen. So um, so I say quit now because if that actually works, then you should. Um, anyway, that's the end of my presentation, so I'll take some questions if anyone has any. I think. Do I have time? Okay. How much do you use the pros in these kind of situations to scare you now that you're so wildly successful? And what do you do to get around that stuff? The, the Posey situation is a business that um, had 
that was overwhelmed by the amount of demand they had on Groupon and didn't feel like they should do it again. So the vast majority of businesses that are featured on Groupon, we survey every business and with over 3,000 results, 95% are satisfied. So um, if there was a story written for every, about every local merchant that regretted their decision to do newspaper advertising, there would be nothing else in the newspaper. So uh, we look at it as let's minimize that percentage of people that have a bad experience. Let's invest in having world-class merchant services and educating people about this new model of, of local commerce. Um, but, it, but it doesn't scare me. I mean, I believe in what we're doing. Sure. It wasn't a black and white switch, actually. This is interesting. It was kind of like grass growing, where one day it's like, oh my gosh, we're spending all our time on Groupon. So actually, a lot of the core development team continued working on the point. And then I was working on this blog, and I built a FileMaker app to distribute all the coupons. Um, and, uh, and that's what we were doing. And then slowly, there was more and more um, it became more and more valid to invest in, in spending time on Groupon. And two things, I mean, the success we were having with it were energizing in a way that the whole team just got behind it very quickly. And the second thing is that, well, at first we looked at it as a service that, um, I mean, it was the tail that wa wagged the dog. It was going to bring in money while we solved the world's unsolvable problems working on the point. Um, we started to feel like, uh, the, I mean, when we started hearing feedback from the merchants and customers, we realized, ironically, that we were doing far more good with Groupon than we ever had or probably ever would with the point. So that was able, that, that allowed us to really get behind it and really get excited about it. Any advice on early employee hiring? Advice on early employee hiring. Avoid um, titles. You know, stuff that, as much as you can, I guess. Do them if you have to in order to hire, but don't create too much structure around that stuff because you may need to make changes later. I probably have other advice too, but for whatever reason, I thought of that piece of advice. <laughs> you, you on that side with the green shirt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I never really cared about activism. I, <laughs> I care about social engineering and doing things that, that make a big difference. And activism happens to be an area where uh, you, can, you can have a big impact. That's not entirely true, but I like the way it sounds. It seems like some of the broad focus of the point may make sense in Groupon 2.0 and that line code that you drew. You know, Groupon 1.0, you know, maybe we get the focus, but some of the broader actions. Yeah. Right, so he said some of the broader focus of Groupon, or of the point, might actually make sense in a, in a Groupon 2.0 world. And I, and I agree with that. I mean, the biggest problem with Groupon is how do you get to scale? It's the classic chicken and egg, or sorry, the point, is how do you get to scale? And there, we never had a solution for that. So all the examples that I talked about when I, was, when I was pitching the business and the ones that we tried to go after were these massive um, change initiatives, and the small ones just weren't nearly as interesting to people. Mm -hmm. um, by building an awesome product. I, I mean, so just the, the lead that we've managed to maintain in the face of uh, thousands, I think, or hundreds of clones, I mean, I think speaks to the passion that we have for, for building something that's awesome and just an awesome customer experience. I think all these ideas around network effects are... are are overrated. I mean, it's nice to have that kind of such stuff strategically built into your model, but how far did network effects get MySpace? You know, there's, there's more examples of businesses with those network effects getting overtaken by somebody who out-innovated them than otherwise. I mean, I think eBay is a good example of someone where the, almost the exception that proves the rule where the network's effects are so strong that they could, um, th they could just survive off of the critical mass they had. Um, it's, it started that way from the beginning. So 
Um, I played in a band with uh, one of our community managers at, at the point in, um, in, in college. And uh, we, he was just a funny guy, and he started doing the writing. And we always, we always had a firm belief in building a product that we wanted to use. And part of that was creating awesome editorial copy that didn't feel like people were reading advertising. And as we've grown, actually, the increasing pressure that there is to conform to the way that businesses typically behave is just a greater motivation for us to act out and be weird. So we now do things like we um, launched this thing called Gruspawn, which is a scholarship fund for, um, for children to get a full college scholarship if their parents met using a Groupon. So, like, <laughs> this is one of those things where I say, like, I mean, you could, you, I could pretend like the reason we did that is because we want to help the kids, but I just think it's funny to create these awkward first interactions on a date <laughs> where, like, you're having a good date and someone pulls out a Groupon and it's like you have to confront the issue of having babies. Um, <laughs> So it's fun to run a big company. You should, you should do it. So uh, do, do you think it's a large cut? I know sometimes I hear all of it. Uh, that That's not true. But what we do do is sustainable. Yes, next question. <laughs> <laughs> Creating incentives for hiring early stage people, what sort of incentives do you give them? Equity. They make a, I mean, a lot of, they're whiners, so a lot of their commission plans are based off the commission plan we had when we thought we'd be doing, you know, $100,000 of revenue a year in one of these cities. So they just, they make a ton of money. Huh? Oh, oh, they had, we had money, so we gave people salary and everything, and then we just paid them based off the commission. We, we had raised money. Our writers, not yet, but we'd love to. Um, and it's just one of those, when you're growing as fast as we are, um, stuff, stuff like that, uh, and some A-B testing, also any kind of internal facing optimization, we, we put off. So we, ha we do stupid things, like we have a staff of um, 10 people probably copying the, the, the records out of Salesforce manually into, uh, into our Groupon platform, just because it's not worth our time to take one of our engineers for a week and have them tie into the API and everything, you know. Right there. Did you have a question? No, he doesn't. Um, so you guys are doing this model, right? Um, talk about some of the advantages of running a team that's starting up as a model versus all the advantages and disadvantages with your product. Um, the advantages are that, I mean, I was lucky to get tapped into a very entrepreneurial group in Chicago with, with my co-founders. I mean, I wouldn't have been able to do any of this if I didn't have the co-founders that I have. And um, I, mean, I mean, they came to me and said, why don't you drop out of school and turn this into a company? I'll give you a bunch of money. And I was like, people do that? That's crazy. Like, I didn't know what VC was. I didn't know what angel capital was or anything. It's not part of the, the culture in the way that it is here. Huh? Yeah, yeah. And um, so, so Chicago has been, a, been great for a business like ours, where it's largely a, a, tech, a hybrid technology human business, right? We have 2,500 people. Maybe 100 of them are in engineering, and everybody else is doing other stuff. Um, for the, the downside is while there's engineering talent in Chicago, the, it's a shallow pool. So we've kind of reluctantly realized that we have to have an office out here and hire our engineers out here. That's it. Thanks, guys. The Kobe Bryant drafting behind Michael Jordan, uh, as recognized by Michael Jordan, giving him a shoe. Uh, uh, this is amazing, where athletes typically don't like uh, younger athletes stealing their moves. And Michael Jordan was honored by the mentis, the mentee quality of Kobe Bryant, that he actually dedicated the Air Jordan 6 to Kobe Bryant, which is actually the shoes that I'm wearing right now in Laker colors. It's a Chicago Bull letting somebody have Laker colors on his shoe. Having a mentor reduces friction, and having a mentor... Uh, helps you in your career and 
this is mentorships chapter five of my mentor's book, What They Don't Teach at Harvard Business School. His, Mark McCormick believed in doing sequels, which is really what, what you're doing when you're DJing two chasms, is you're really doing a sequel. Or the thing that you're trying to innovate, you recognize that there's a prequel. Let me repeat that. The innovative thing that you're trying to do, you wanna recognize the things that came before it. And that would be a prequel, where you don't wanna just be your own special snowflake saying, oh, no one's ever come up with anything like this before. You wanna be able to be like the Wright brothers who actually could mentor mention uh, Langley and the four other people that failed trying to do uh, an airplane. Kobe Bryant also said, I stand on the shoulders of giants, which is why I'm able to have these innovations. So the Kobe Bryant, Michael Jordan drafting can't be overstressed. So I'm trying to stress it more. Bikers in drafting are also CS-183E drafting behind CS-183S. No need, no trust, no momentum is a problem in sales. And that's why drafting is working so well inside of this lecture 15. Now, to make sure that we're mentor, mentee, jiving and hive minding, draw that picture of the diagram and then tag me and load it up on Twitter. And I'll like it, that's interaction. Oh my goodness, I just found this. This Andrew Mason uh, polishing up your YC turd and getting super rich. So I actually drew with a finger YC right on there. I don't know when I did this picture, but I found it under CS23X, which is awesome. And I'm surprised that I found it. This lecture bookends with the slide that Andrew Mason started. So you've watched the full length video. You've listened to 27 sub videos that address polishing a turd. So I'm gonna wrap with this slide that I want you to write out and print out and put on your treasure map wall. I want you to take a picture of it and then text or tweet it and then tag me in it because polishing up your turds and getting super rich, that's this entire class encapsulated onto one slide.